Yeah? You hear me? Cool. Perfect. So yeah, again, I'm, I'm going to be talking about decentralized social networks and so how we can, you can use this technology to create um, social networks where there's more privacy, ownership over your data, uh, censorship resistant and a lot of uh, cool properties and concepts that Per Giorgio uh, talked about earlier. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about Twitter as a centralized social network example, moving to Mastodon, which is a federated model, uh, which has some pros and cons with respect to Twitter. And then uh, going along with the decentralization spectrum, I'm going to be talking about Forecaster, which is to me one of the best uh, examples uh, so far in this, in this space, um, but it's still like so, so nascent. So, uh, just to start, um, we know already from what Per Giorgio said that centralization is not ideal, but it's also hard to avoid for many reasons. Um, te this technology is not ready to be used by, uh, in mainstream and by mass adoption, you know. Uh, but we also know that whoever owns a platform, whoever owns a company, controls everything on it. In this example of Elon Musk, I'm referring to when he bought Twitter and he was able to change all the rules in the platform. He's controlling the namespace, meaning that uh, he can ban you, he can suspend you, he can, I don't know, shadow ban, remove your post, uh, censor uh, your, your speech. He also controls the network and the protocol, meaning that if you are a developer and you want to build on top of Twitter, you need to ask for an API key and you don't know uh, if you're getting it, and even if you get it, you only see the data that they want you to see and use because of competitive reasons, of course. And so centralization is, is a problem, and a lot of users are being affected by what is doing on Twitter, but I'm taking Twitter just as an, as an example because the same holds for Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, uh, LinkedIn, whatever. The other problem with, with this centralized platform is that uh, they are wallet gardens, meaning that the information is not portable. If you don't like uh, what a platform is doing, what a company is doing, and their direction and their rules, you have mm, no choice unless moving into another platform, but it's, it's painful because you, you need a way to migrate your data and migrate your followers, and you can do anything with that. So it's, it's bad for users. Um, and that's why I believe that we should really be uh, striving to build uh, more open protocols uh, and not platforms uh, that are locking ourselves into uh, centralized services um, because simply because nobody can buy TCPIP or SMTP uh, and change the rules while everybody can buy like you know Twitter you buy Twitter and, and you change um, how it's working the um, the platform or the services but that said, even open protocols like SMTP, as I've uh, been saying before, they are not immune to centralization because we know that, for example, email and browsing, they are heavily centralized on, on Google just because we all use, or at least most of us use Gmail and Chrome with respect to Outlook or, I don't know, Yahoo or other services. But at least they allow us to move and switch between competing clients and I can still communicate which, let's say that I'm using Gmail, I can still send you an email if you're using another provider. And that's, um, that's okay, because then it's up to the user to decide whatever, whatever they prefer, and also mi migrating their data on the new service. Then after the centralized model, we have this Fediverse, the federated model, uh, which is common for Mastodon. How many of you know about Mastodon? Ever heard about it? No, okay. <laughs> Yeah, Mastodon is um, one of the main examples using this federated model out there. And I believe that one year ago, a lot of people were migrating out of Twitter to move into this uh, new uh, social network, um, thinking that it was a, a decentralized environment, while it was a uh, federated environment. So the Fediverse, which is um, an example on, on which Mastodon has been built off is a collection of tools and platforms that you can build using the ActivityPub protocol, which is an open source protocol uh, with API specifications to connect clients and servers and let them interact in a way that everybody, in theory, can spin up uh, a server, an instance, and uh, build their own social network. Um, this to say that on Mastodon, for example, you have many servers run by individuals. While on Twitter, you have a single server, a single feed, and a single experience. Um, of course, these are some improvements, and 
but also a lot of drawbacks. Starting from the, draw the drawbacks, one of the main problems is still centralization, because since it's technically challenging to run an instance on Mastodon, uh, people tend to use an existing instance, meaning that there are three or four um, popular instances like Mastodon.social, Mastodon.art, uh, that aggregate a lot of the users on, in the protocol. And uh, this is a problem because if that instance, for example, Mastodon.social goes offline or is purchased by a bad actor, users using that instance are affected uh, in a negative way, of course. But at least on Mastodon, it's somehow easier with respect to Twitter to migrate your data on a new instance if you don't like uh, the previous one. But still, on Mastodon, you cannot migrate everything. You can only migrate followers, uh, but you cannot migrate your username, your posts, your likes, whatever you produced is stuck in that instance. And uh, if that instance, for some reason, disappears because, I mean, I'm, I'm running this instance at my uh, at my place, I have this server at home, and at some point I decide that I don't want to do it anymore. You lose all your data, and, and this is bad because you cannot do anything with it. The other problem is about communication, because, again, about the centralization issues here, uh, and in the federated model, the problem is that you don't have a single point of failure. You have many point of failures, so all the instances on Bastodon are small, small point of centralization where the admins can do whatever they want, so they can decide uh, which instances can communicate with their users, or they can also decide to suspend your account because uh, you are, I don't know, publishing the, the wrong stuff. And there's also a problem of privacy, because there's no end-to-end -end encryption, and you're trusting these guys running an instance at their, at their place or whatever they're doing, uh, and they can read your data. Uh, you are trusting that they are doing something to prevent data breaches. They are, you are trusting them that they are not selling your data or doing anything bad with it. Uh, but this is not just a Mastodon problem. Twitter has the same problem. Instagram has the same problem. TikTok, whatever. The problem here with Mastodon is that you're moving from trusting a big company, public company, exposed and regulated, to trusting some hobbyists uh, running their own server. And so it's, to me, it's even like worse than using a centralized uh, provider. There are other protocols before going deep down into Farcaster and the blockchain uh, space for social networks. For example, there's Blue Sky, which is a protocol uh, born inside Twitter. So there was a team in the Twitter uh, company um, developing these open source protocols. And now they are a standalone team, uh, which is also backed by um, Jack Dorsey, one of the Twitter co-founders. And, and they are using a federated approach as well, but they are trying to um, make it easier to migrate your data, make it easier to customize your experience on it. So I believe it's a, it's a good compromise. And in, in the last like months, it's getting a lot, a lot of traction, especially from users moving uh, into this new social network. And then there's also Nost, which is a, a nice example, but it's more like an, an, OB, an OB protocol, cool to try, but still very, very niche. Here comes Farcaster. So Farcaster is the first example of sufficiently decentralized social network. Sufficient decentralization is, is not a joke. It's, <laughs> it's something really serious to me because it means that they are like, trying to use the blockchain for just for what they need. I mean, there are other projects out there using blockchain and trying to decentralize everything. For example, there's this other protocol called Lens, which uh, is building everything on top of the, of the blockchain, which is not so efficient. While Farcaster found, found a way to decentralize only the key components or, of their system to offer uh, key features like privacy, ownership, censorship resistance, and everything we've said so far. What does it mean, sufficient decentralization? So a social network su uh, achieves sufficient decentralization if two users can find each other and communicate, even if the rest of the network wants to prevent it. This means that at any point in time, a user using a sufficient decentralized social network should be able to reach their audience and should be able to read messages from other uh, people in the network. How to achieve this sufficient decentralization? First of all, as a user, I should be able to claim a unique username. Uh, I should be able to post 
always post messages under that username and I should always be able to read messages from valid usernames. And, and I think that like, the namespace is, is really important here because, for example, talking about Twitter, we have a unique uh, namespace, meaning that in the platform you can only have one, I don't know, limone underscore ETH uh, as an handle, uh, but that can be revoked by the company owner. On Mastodon, instead, you have, uh, and in general in federated models, you have that on each instance there's a unique namespace, meaning that on mastodon.social, you can have limon underscore it, and it's owned by me, but uh, on, another, um, on another instance, there could be another person claiming my same handle. And so this property, uh, it's not working there. While on Forecaster, instead, they, um, they decided to move the, the, the name registry, so the, the handle thing and the username on chain, so they have a smart contract, which is owned by nobody unless like, the person claiming the um, authorizing the transaction or whatever. So there's a single namespace on the protocol. It's not owned by a company or a, single, uh, or a single actor, but it's just owned by the people claiming those usernames. So in this case, uh, I'm active on Forecaster, and I have my username attached and tied to my uh, Ethereum address, for example, together with uh, a unique identifier. Another point to mention about Forecaster is that it's currently in only because it's kind of beta, so it's not a final solution, don't expect to find something really solid, but it's still like the, the most solid one out there, I'd say. And it's not Twitter on the blockchain, because again, they, are, they built on the blockchain only the, the name registry, because it's the most important thing to provide, again, privacy, ownership, censorship resistance, permissionless uh, innovation and whatever, uh, while the rest, uh, it's built on a, on top of a decentralized network, which is not uh, a blockchain-based network, which has like different, you know, synchronization mechanism, data replication, and whatever. So when you're posting to Forecaster, you're publishing content in this network, and there are um, um, a set of nodes um, synchronizing with the status of the network, and you can read from whoever you want. And this because, again, the blockchain is a poor storage mechanism for user data. Uh, for two reasons. The blockchain is immutable. This means that you cannot delete your post. On Lens, which the, the social network I was talking before, you are publishing on the Polygon chain. Uh, this means that once you minted this NFT as a, as a post, you cannot do anything with that. It's there forever. And it's bad for a social network uh, user experience. And it's also bandwidth limited because authorizing transaction on chain, executing transaction on chain, uh, somebody has to pay for gas fees, either the user or the, or, or the service provider, whatever, that's somebody that has to pay uh, the nodes on chain, so either like on Ethereum or Polygon, uh, you need to pay some fees to just create a post, uh, and it's not, so it, of course it's not scalable in terms of like the users using the platform. Why? using blockchain for, um, for the name registry. So what's, what are like, the main pros of using uh, blockchain as a storage, mecha as a storage yeah, mechanism for uh, the name registry instead of using a MySQL instance, MongoDB, whatever you, you like the most? Um, for two reasons, again, because the blockchain is distributed and, uh, and ownerless, meaning that there's no single actor that can modify, own, or control uh, the smart contract that um, records the namespace and the addresses tied to which ID in the network. And also because blockchains are permissionless and public, meaning that at any point in time, uh, everyone, everyone uh, can uh, access the state of the blockchain and check, uh, um, for example, which address is associated to my handle, which address is associated with my ID. Uh, without the need to ask for an API key. You just need to uh, spin up a node and, and download the data and, and you can do it. What are the key features of such uh, a social network? Um, account ownership, again, because you are the only owner of your account. Avoiding recentralization, because we talked about recentralization on Mastodon, for example, because of the problem of migrating data on Forecaster, uh, there's no need for, my, for migrating data because everything, like the name registry is on chain, so you just move 
between different clients. Let's say we have client A, client B, which are a mobile application and a web application. You can just log in with your, uh, with your address and you already have everything um, at your disposal. Permissionless innovation because everything is open uh, without the need, again, to ask for an API key. If I want to build an application on top of Forecaster, uh, I can just, um, again, connect with the nodes in the network, read their data, and provide uh, whatever user experience I, I want to. So there are people, for example, creating clients more like Instagram focused on images, people creating uh, platforms for events, all on the same open protocol, just like you have Gmail, Outlook, and uh, I don't know, Yahoo Mail, built on top of SMTP. Uh, on Forecaster, you have Warpcast, you have Eventcaster, you have Launchcaster, built on top of uh, the Forecaster protocol. Censorship resistance and moderation, because you cannot be banned by the, uh, on, on the protocol, from the protocol, but you can be moderated by the clients, meaning that, uh, let's say I'm using uh, uh, client A and the admin decide that I'm block listed for some reasons, I can still access the same network of people and users uh, just by downloading a new application that is built on top of the same protocol. And then user experience, also very important, um, because on f using Forecaster, but also like other products that are coming out in these, uh, in these days, thanks to account abstraction, uh, there's no need to know how to use the blockchain, how to interact uh, with a wallet and whatever, because everything is happening behind the scenes. The last point uh, before closing uh, is about who is hosting and controlling the data. Again, on Twitter, data is owned and uh, is stored and owned uh, by the company. On Mastodon, each instance admin is uh, storing and owning uh, uh, the data of the instance. Uh, on Forecaster, the data is distributed and, uh, and replicated, replicated across the network. Uh, and about large media, for example, instead of using uh, centralized services like Amazon, uh, uh, buckets or Cloudinary or other services where you can store images, videos, or um, large media. Again, uh, there are solutions like IPFS and Arway, which are more decentralized uh, in that sense. Before concluding, I want to mention that everything that I've said about Forecaster, about Lens, and this decentralized social network landscape is still nascent. So they are all experiments, uh, someone better than the others, but um, I believe that the most important thing is that they are all open, so you can just study them and you might, might get like, inspired uh, to build other things uh, on top of them, expanding them, um, and again, permissionless innovation. So Forecaster may just be the start for another uh, wave of social networks which are even better than it. Um, some research opportunities, I thought, so something that might be interesting um, to go deep down uh, this year, because I believe that this year, with some improvements on, for example, on the Ethereum chain uh, regarding account abstraction, will be really interesting to see how we can build uh, social networks or like products with better UX. Uh, would be also be interesting, uh, of course, to study the whole social media landscape out there with all the pros and cons in much more details. Data availability networks, like what Farcaster is building, for example, how is it working, the, the decentralized data network? Is it efficient or not? How we can improve it? Or how we can be even more decentralized, whatever. And then, of course, all these protocols are open source. So you can contribute, expand them, build on top of them, and, uh, and they are more than happy if you're doing so. Um, so I believe that if you are curious about these topics, of course, reach out to me. Uh, here's my, my website with all my contacts, Telegram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, happy to, to help you and, and chat about these topics. Thank you.